Hi everyone, um, welcome to our first talk of the Lent term and of 2021. Um, we have with us today uh, Professor uh, John Cook and just before I introduce him I'd like to do a tiny plug. We now have our new website kusap.org live so please do check that out. Um, we also have an upcoming talk next week by Professor Paul Offit. Um, in case you're interested please sign up. But um, yeah without wasting too much time I'll introduce Professor John Cook. Um, he's a research assistant professor at the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University. Um, he, in 2007, he founded the Skeptical Science website, which won the 2011 Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the advancement of climate change knowledge. Um, he's also co-authored college textbooks uh, like Climate Change Examining the Facts and Climate Change Science, a Modern Synthesis. And in 2013, he published uh, a seminal paper finding 97% scientific consensus on human-caused global warming. And that outcome was highlighted by President Barack Obama and former UK Prime Minister David Cameron. Um, he also co-hosts uh, a podcast, Evidence Squared, um, and he's just a very prominent science communicator. So uh, please, could we have Professor Cook? Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the intro. I need to update that intro because the Evidence Squared podcast finished a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm hoping to get, get back into it at some point because there is a dearth of podcasts on science communication. But um, but for now, it's, it's unfortunately not around. All right. So I'm going to open uh, or start sharing my slides. Uh, and just let me know if you can see them OK right now. I'll need one person to. Yep, we can see them. Now. Okay, great. All right, so um, all right, I will jump into it, uh, but don't hesitate to stop me if if there's any problems or questions. Now, I'm going to be talking about my research into how to fight misinformation, uh, and I've gone through this um, research path trying to trying to develop, firstly, theoretically, work out effective ways to to counter misinformation. Uh, but then once I found some good theoretical foundations, then how do you put it into practice? And most importantly, how do you put it into practice in a way that you can scale up to actually shift the needle in society and actually make a difference in stopping the spread of misinformation you know, you know, across the population, which is uh, a big problem. And I was kind of, I apologise to um, Lily for um, kind of <laughs> holding his feet to the fire in our conversation just before. You were doing a really good job, by the way, in answering my questions. Now, uh, I, you've had a, a couple of researchers speak to your group um, who were doing very similar work to mine, and I've, I've collaborated with, with most of them. Stefan Lewandowski, um, Sandra van der Linden, John Rosenbeek. Uh, and so some of my work uh, covers the same ground that they talked about. I apologize if some of this is repetitive. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the theory and the research, but then um, the second half of my presentation, I'm going to talk about putting it into practice and how um, the particular application I've been developing addresses a lot of challenges that I've been running up against for, for years now in, in developing um, solutions to misinformation. So. So the question that I've been addressed, I've been focused on ever since I started my PhD working at the University of Queensland, this was back in 2011. Uh, and I started that PhD with the question, how do you stop misinformation from spreading? And over the course of five years of research, I ended up coming out of that dissertation with a single answer, inoculation theory. Uh, and I stumbled upon it by accident through through the course of my PhD research, I was I was actually testing different ways of communicating climate change to people, and I found that for a small segment of the population, communicating the 97% consensus on climate change actually backfired for just a, a tiny segment of um, Americans who were at the far right of the political spectrum. And what was happening with these people was when they heard that there was a 97% consensus amongst climate scientists, that actually activated their distrust of climate scientists and caused them to believe in climate change even less after hearing a 
a consensus message. And so that got me thinking, is it possible to do the opposite? Could you prime people so that if they heard misinformation, it actually activated their distrust of the misinformation source and caused it to backfire? So I designed an experiment where I explained the technique used to mislead people. And then I showed them some misinformation. And what I found was priming them by making them aware of a misleading technique neutralized the misinformation. Didn't quite make it backfire, but at least it stopped the misinformation from misleading people. And when I was presenting this research at a psychology conference in Sydney, one of the professors in the room um, said to me, that sounds a lot like inoculation theory. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> I'd, I'd never even heard of it, uh, you know, until while I was presenting my research results. Uh, and when I went um, and started reading about inoculation theory, I found out that that's what I was doing. I was inoculating the participants in my experiment. And um, far from me inventing a new communication technique, inoculation theory dated back to the 1950s. Uh, and uh, the idea of this branch of psychological research is to take um, or, or build people's immunity to misinformation by exposing them to a weakened form of misinformation. And by weakened form, uh, usually what that means is by explaining the rhetorical techniques or the logical fallacies um, that the misinformation uses to distort the facts or mislead people. Um, and so I've been focused then on um, explaining the techniques and the, the fallacies in misinformation in order to build up their immunity to, to science denial, uh, particularly climate denial, which has been my focus. And I found a really useful framework for explaining the techniques of science denial has been Flick, the five characteristics of science denial, fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking and conspiracy theories. Um, and uh, the, there are, from, a, from the perspective of uh, climate communication, which has been my focus, I found uh, there are two uh, main benefits of inoculation. Um, and there's two benefits for two different audiences. It's really important from a public engagement and a communication point of view to recognise that the public is not one monolith. But it's actually made up of a whole um, you know, set of different segments. Uh, and you know, different segments with different beliefs, different cultural backgrounds, um, and responding to information in different ways. Uh, and so therefore, it's important to not only think about who you're targeting with your communication, but what is your goal with them? Uh, and for me, the work I do, there are really two main audiences that I'm thinking about, and and I have two different goals for each of these audiences. Uh, uh, in the case of climate change, uh, we, there's research done by my colleagues here at George Mason University in collaboration with Yale University, where they have um, performed these national surveys twice a year, and they use all this survey data to segment the population up into six different groups. So they call them the six Americas, but the same work has been applied to um, Australian populations, Indian populations, and, and probably other countries um, that I'm not aware of. But the, the, the six different groups range from dismissive of climate change all the way up to alarmed about climate change. Uh, but I, from a communication point of view, I tend to think of three main groups the concerned and alarmed. So these are the ones who are most convinced about climate change. And in the US, they add up to roughly, uh, I think it's about 54% of the population in the latest survey data. Then there's the, the um, cautious, doubtful, and um, disengaged. And that group is about 30 odd percent of the population, or about 35%. And then you have the dismissive, and they're only currently 7% of the population. Uh, 
So you have the, the convinced, the unconvinced, and the dismissive. Now, a lot of, like whenever I give talks about climate communication, I'm always asked, how do you change a climate denier's mind? And I point out that climate deniers are only 7% of the population in the US, which is one of the higher percentages. In other countries, it's less. Uh, and so uh, probably a better question than what do you say to dismissives is who should we be targeting? And I think it's those other two groups that we should be targeting, the, the majority who are convinced or the about 30 odd percent who are um, unconvinced or disengaged. And, and there's two different goals with them. With the unconvinced, they are the ones who are, uh, they don't believe, they're not science deniers, but they're vulnerable to misinformation from climate deniers. So with that group, the goal is to inoculate them, build up their resilience so that they are less um, vulnerable to being misled by misinformation. With the convinced, that 54%, while they're convinced about climate change, they're not necessarily um, talking about it. Most of the convinced and alarmed don't talk about climate change with their friends and family. And that has this disturbing flow on effect. When people don't talk about climate change with their friends and family and elected officials, people come away with the impression that no one cares about climate change. And then that uh, creates this spiral of silence. Um, and people self-censor because they're worried that given the, this misconception of no one caring about climate change, if they talk about it, then they could receive pushback and they could be made to look stupid. So inoculation has this other effect. If it's a topic um, that's controversial, like climate change, when people are inoculated and they understand the, the rhetorical techniques or the, the arguments of climate misinformation, that empowers them and gives them confidence to be able to talk about the issue. Um, researchers call this post-inoculation talk. Inoculation empowers people to, it gives them confidence to talk about an issue because they uh, feel more confident that if there is pushback, they'll know how to respond. Um, that was, I'd spent a lot longer on that slide than I was intending to. The, the gist of it was two main groups, convinced and unconvinced, and two goals, um, inoculating, building resilience, and empowering people, giving them confidence to talk about controversial topics. Uh, and I, before I jump into some specifics, I wanted to just talk in general terms about a technique I use to inoculate um, people against misinformation. And this was a technique I came across um, working with some critical thinking philosophers. We, were, we wrote some research in 2018 on how to deconstruct misinformation in order to identify reasoning fallacies in the myth. And uh, identifying the logical fallacy in a myth is just the first step. The next step is how do you communicate that to people? How do you communicate critical thinking and logical fallacies? And these philosophers um, pointed out to me that a really powerful and user-friendly, accessible technique is parallel argumentation. What this involves is taking the bad logic in, in a, um, a myth and transplanting it into a parallel situation um, and then applying the same logic in the, this parallel situation, the more absurd and extreme it is, the clearer and more obvious the flawed logic becomes in the original argument. So let me give you an example of what I, of what I mean. Here is a all too common example of a climate myth. We see this every winter. Whenever it's cold, you'll hear someone argue, uh, it's cold, whatever happened to global warming? The general gist being that cold weather proves global warming doesn't exist. Let's take that logic and transplant it into a parallel situation just to show how flawed that logic is. This logic is just the same as arguing that at nighttime it's dark and therefore that proves that the sun doesn't exist. 
it's cherry picking. It's not looking at the full picture. It's just looking at someone's um, experience in a single moment in time at a single place and ignoring that there's a bigger world out there. Uh, uh, and just because we don't see it uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's kind of like object permanence, but for adults or lack of object permanence. Now, this idea of parallel argumentation is, is a technique that I found was um, really powerful in explaining logical fallacies in an engaging, entertaining way. And we've been testing it in a number of experiments and finding that it holds people's attention longer. It's more likely to be shared or liked or retweeted. Um, and, and because it holds people's attention, that's, it, it makes it more effective in, in debunking misinformation. And so I've been building up a, a backlog of cartoon parallel arguments. And if you, and I put them all into a PowerPoint, which is at this address at the top of the slide, sks.to slash cranky PPT, um, which is a whole bunch of cartoon parallel arguments debunking myths about climate change. So the idea of, of this PowerPoint was to make all these cartoons freely available for anyone who does climate presentations, um, who does you know, public talks or, or any kinds of talks, and is looking for just something to, um, to spice up their, their slideshow. So you're all welcome to jump in there and, and use those, those slides. So, so getting back to FLIP, the five techniques of science denial, uh, I just wanted to quickly run through them and explain them to give you a little bit more information. Uh, and then I'll then I'll um, talk about how how I've tried to explain these in a way uh, that is engaging and um, uh, a way that's effective with the general public and students, um, but also in a way that can scale up and, and reach a lot of people. So the first one is fake experts, and this is about uh, presenting an unqualified person or, or institution. Um, as someone who is a credible expert. So it's, it's taking people who don't have the relevant expertise or have no expertise, but trying to portray them to the public as uh, having expertise, um, particularly expertise on, that, on a specific topic. Uh, now, in the real world, uh, we don't tolerate fake experts on issues that matter. We don't want a computer scientist performing heart surgery on us. That's unacceptable. And yet we are often have fake experts um, used to mislead the public about complicated issues like climate change or COVID uh, safety measures or vaccination. Um, and those have real world implications. Like we were talking just earlier about WhatsApp and how that has misinformation disseminated through WhatsApp has had real world implications and got people killed. Uh, we see the same thing with climate change and vaccination and COVID. These have had real world health implications or, or in the case of climate change, health and environmental implications that will that we, we will wear those um, for decades or centuries into the future. Uh, and the problem is fake experts is one of the most effective strategies. Humans are social animals. And we, we rely on, on other people for information, particularly when we don't have the, the bandwidth or the training to be able to assess the information ourselves. We all rely on experts in other topics that we're not experts on. That's just, it's human nature and it's, it's actually a pretty efficient way to, um, to, to uh, come to opinions, uh, given that we all have limited resources. But that means that we're also vulnerable to fake experts. And if you don't have the ability to discern a person who has the relevant expertise from someone who um, is not an expert, um, that makes you vulnerable to the fake expert strategy. Here's an example of fake expert strategy applied in the case of climate change. And some, some research actually done by Sander van der Linden. Uh, I don't know whether he mentioned this when he presented to you, but he tested half a dozen different types of climate myths, and this one was the most effective in 
reducing climate perceptions and support for climate action. So this um, misinformation is an example of fake experts in bulk uh, and it's really effective and it's viral. Uh, in 2016, over the course of the uh, US election campaign, a Facebook article about, or, or just an article about this global warming petition project promoting the idea that there was no consensus on climate change was the most shared article about climate change on Facebook over 2016. So it's it's viral and it's effective. And we see we've seen it over just this last half year. Um, the exact same strategy of fake experts in bulk was used to misinform the public about uh, COVID um, measures, like what should we do about COVID? Um, this petition was saying we shouldn't be social distancing, we shouldn't be shutting down. It was even questioning mask wearing and promoting um, treatments like hydroxychloroquine, which had no scientific uh, evidence supporting their use. Um, so we see this fake expert strategy used across different scientific issues. The second uh, technique of science denial is logical fallacies. And this is a broad umbrella. Logical fallacies in general terms is any argument where the premises or the starting assumptions don't lead to the conclusion. It's like uh, saying, I have blue eyes, therefore I know quantum physics. The premise is I have blue eyes. The conclusion is I know quantum physics. The conclusion does not follow from the premise. The, the two are unconnected. Uh, and so there are many different types of logical fallacies, such as false dichotomy, red herring, single cause fallacy, um, uh, ad hominem attacks. And, and these all um, are basically non sequiturs where the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. Uh, and we can always jump into more detail down the track. But I'll just give you one example, which is one of the most common myths that you will see um, about climate change. And it's the myth that because climate has changed naturally before in the past, therefore what's happening now must be natural as well. In fact, just over the last 24 hours, there's a video on Twitter, I just tweeted it a few hours ago, of Senator Rand Paul arguing this. He was saying, well, climate's changed in the past and Milankovitch cycles, although he didn't call it Milankovitch cycles, I think he got the name wrong, but he was saying that orbital wiggles, uh, the Earth's changes in the Earth's orbit, uh, have driven Earth's um, climate change in the past. Therefore, you know, how do you not know that it's, it's driving climate change now? Uh, and this argument commits single cause fallacy. Just because something caused uh, something in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the cause now. That logic is exactly the same as arguing this person who has a knife sticking out of their back must have died of natural causes because people have died of natural causes in the past. Just because there was this one cause in the past that has caused deaths doesn't mean that it has to be the cause now. Um, so single cause fallacy is one example of a logical fallacy. But let me move on to the third technique of science denial, impossible expectations. This is a common strategy that the tobacco industry perfected in the mid 20th century. Uh, and the idea of this strategy is to demand higher and higher levels of scientific proof in order to delay acting on the science. So the tobacco industry kept trying to raise the standard of proof that smoking caused cancer or other health impacts in order to delay government regulation of the tobacco industry. And then the uh, climate deniers took on that same strategy and demanded impossible expectations of proof um, that human activity caused climate change in order to delay government regulation of the fossil fuel industry. It's the same dynamic demanding proof that an industry's product is causing damage in order to let the industry keep doing what they're doing and making profits. Uh, the problem with this argument is science never offers absolute proof. We always 
scientists always offer a range of expected values. Um, and so when a scientist will say, well, this is going to happen in, in this range of time or this amount of impact, they're not saying because there's uncertainty, we don't know if it's going to happen. They're just saying we don't know exactly when it'll happen. Uh, and so by demanding impossible expectations, you, you're really setting yourself up for dangerous impacts down the track. We know the impacts are going to happen. We don't know exactly how bad they'll be, but that's not an excuse for not acting. It's, it's, a, it's, an ex, it's really a reason that we need to pay even more attention to the science because when there's uncertainty, it means that there's uh, just as much likelihood that the impacts will be even worse than our best estimate. The fourth technique of science denial is cherry picking. And this involves um, just using select pieces of data or information or evidence while ignoring the full body of evidence. Um, and a general rule of thumb, uh, in, if you're trying to work out, is someone cherry picking or not, just answer this question. Is the conclusion that they come to from their evidence the same conclusion that you would come to if you were considering the full body of evidence? And if the answer is no, then that's cherry picking. Um, and so like we see this often in climate change, for example, we see that, um, well, no, let me not get into that example. Let, let me just illustrate that, that general principle. Um, looking at only a select piece of the puzzle um, can cause you to ignore the full picture. If you're in a sinking ship and the bow is rising, uh, if you're only looking at your particular instance and ignoring what's happening to the ship overall, then yeah, that kind of cherry picking can lead to a negative, <laughs> outcomes and here is an example that we see in um, climate change where um, the overall long-term trend in surface temperature is warming we see global temperature going up and up over over the last half century um, but it while it's got this long-term trend surface temperature also jumps up and down from year to year because heat is constantly being moved around our climate system the oceans are exchanging heat with the atmosphere. Ocean cycles like El Nino cause this strong up and down cycle from year to year. And because of that up and down variability, it's possible even during a long-term warming trend to cherry pick a short period any time during that warming trend. Uh, and if you're very careful in your cherry picking, you can find any period where it looks like either warming has stopped or even going down slightly. And so we've seen that cherry picking technique used frequently to argue that global warming has stopped. Um, it's harder to do it these days because 2014, 2015 and 2016 were the hottest years on record. And I think 2020 was roughly equal to 2016, give or take. So it's, it's difficult for them to make that argument more recently. But um, you still see you still see them making the argument. Scott Pruitt made that argument in 2017 when the US pulled out of the climate uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. The technique of science denial is conspiracy theories, and this well we've seen a lot of conspiracy theories over the last year. Um, generally, it, it involves um, uh, a secret cabal. Um, we have a, a, um, a nefarious scheme um, and they're deceiving the public and or harming the population in some way. So nefarious intent is, is always a key part of conspiracy theories, having these evil villains, um, but also overriding suspicion of, of institutions, the government, scientists, scientific data, um, Overriding suspicion is, is a key aspect of conspiratorial thinking. Uh, here is a, um, a an old tweet from Donald Trump arguing that climate change is a is a Chinese conspiracy, which 
it's kind of amusing, right? And conspiracy theories can often be funny. Like we think of like the latest conspiracy theory that's getting all the media attention being QAnon and the notion that Democrats and Hollywood actors and you know, other famous people are all um, satanic baby blood drinking, um, you know, pedophiles like who feast on babies in order to get eternal life or something like that's obviously it's it's so extreme and ridiculous that it's easy to laugh it off and think that it's just funny but these conspiracy theories have real world consequences and a, a real example of that being just over the last month when the u.s capital was overrun by QAnon rioters uh, leading to people getting killed so conspiracy theories have real world impacts and that's an extreme example but even more commonly conspiracy theories reduce trust in institutions and trust reduce trust in scientists and that has flow on effects which can cause people to um, behave in unsafe ways when it comes to not listening to experts on covid or in the case of climate change um, denying the science and, and promoting misinformation about climate change. Right, and here is an example of when a conspiracy theory uh, can result in dangerous real-world uh, consequences. So, so that's the five techniques of science denial. And I've been, over the last decade, I've been building up a framework of all these different techniques, all the different fallacies, all the different traits of conspiratorial thinking. And it's become a real landscape. It's complicated. There's a lot of different techniques. And in order to build public resilience against misinformation, in order to inoculate people against all these techniques, people have to learn them all. And that's a communication and education challenge. How do you, how do you communicate that? How do you get people internalizing um, all that information? Like what I just spoke about for the last 10 minutes, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a much deeper um, body of work onto the different techniques of science denial. Uh, and so this, this gives you an idea of the, the challenge in inoculating the public against science denial. It's not just flick. There's, there's um, subcategories for all of those, all of those five techniques of science denial. Uh, and to, to properly build public resilience against all forms of misinformation would require people learning all of these, uh, not just learning that they exist, but understanding the definitions of each and being able to spot them in the wild. And that is not an easy task. And so more broadly speaking, I've been wrestling with three big challenges. I've worked out in lab experiments, in, in my you know, controlled randomized experiments that I've done um, over the last decade of research, I, I know what, what's required to inoculate the public and, and counter misinformation. I know different ways of inoculating, how to boost critical thinking. But even having worked out in the lab solutions to misinformation, uh, it doesn't answer these three challenging questions. The first is psychological. Um, critical thinking is hard. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the book Fast and Slow Thinking, talks about two ways of thinking um, that we all do. This is universal. Um, fast thinking, which is instant, um, uh, quick, uh, and an easy um, gut reaction responses. Uh, and that's almost all of our thinking is quick thinking. We just make emotional instant responses or we rely on mental shortcuts or heuristics. And he also talks about slow thinking, which is um, reasoning through difficult problems, doing a two digit by two digit multiplication or looking at an argument and trying to deconstruct it to see whether the premise leads to the conclusion and what reasoning fallacies might be in the argument. This is all slow thinking, and slow thinking is effortful, and our brains are hardwired for quick thinking. So even at a physical, psychological level, um, 
trying to inoculate people is psychologically very challenging because of the way our brains are hardwired. The second problem is much broader um, and social, oh, sorry, and structural. And that's the question, and I think um, this came up in our discussion before, before we started um, the presentation. How do you get to um, echo chambers? How do you reach people who don't um, don't follow me on Twitter? <laughs> they, um, you know, people who might just watch Fox News or or, um, or just consume uh, information on social media that comes from their little group who all believe the same things. How do you penetrate those echo chambers? Um, even if I can come up with the perfect inoculating message, how do I get that to enough people? who I have no way of reaching. The question is social. Um, the, one of the most fundamental drivers of human psychology is tribalism. We are, again, hardwired to be social animals, which means that we form our identities in large part uh, around the social groups that we belong to. And um, we're very heavily influenced by the beliefs and the behaviour of the people who belong to our social group. And that means that if they, if our social group all believes one thing and then you hear information from a scientist that contradicts that, uh, you have a strong social disincentive to listen to the scientist. And changing your mind, that takes you out of alignment with your social group and then you risk being ostracized by your community. And that comes at great social cost. It's not, it's very undesirable. And so uh, it, it's, it's a reasonable um, response from people to, um, to be resistant to information that contradicts their social group. So, you know, we think, well, why, why are science deniers so rational? In a way, it's, it's kind of rational to be skeptical of information that's going to cause you social problems within your community. So I know that it's not rational for most of you, but social, that is a big challenge. So here are three challenges. And even with the process of inoculation and all flick and critical thinking, um, I, I have been struggling with these three problems and not really having a good answer for for most of my research career. Um, but then over the last two years, I started working on a project and um, just kind of stumbled upon the fact that this approach that I'm working on potentially solves all three of these challenges. And the project I'm working on is a smartphone game that teaches critical thinking about misinformation. Uh, I the, the, actually uh, was inspired by John Rosenbeek and Sandra Vanderlinden's work on the game. And what they, their innovation was they took their research into inoculation and they applied it in a form that they called active inoculation. So typically uh, um, inoculation is passive. Uh, you're explaining the techniques of science denial and people are passively receiving information and becoming inoculated. But active inoculation is a more interactive two-way form of communication where you're not only uh, explaining the recipient to actively perform the, the misinformation or, or do it or argue it. Um, and by actively playing a game where they are the misinformer, that um, helps them internalize the techniques of misinformation in a, in a, in a much more, um, more interactive and engaging way than just passive communication. Uh, what Sander and John uh, focused on with their bad news game was more the media literacy side of misinformation, being able to um, assess information sources. And is this source a reliable source of information or a potentially misinforming source? Uh, what I 
my research is always focused on more the the content in this information and assessing content and arguments and the structure of arguments. Uh, and so what I did with my um, critical thinking game, rather than assessing information sources, was assessing arguments. Um, and so what this game does is uh, it's it has a cranky uncle character who mentors you in how to become a cranky uncle yourself. Um, by cranky uncle meaning someone who denies science. Um, and, and so what cranky uncle does is he takes you through the different denial techniques in Flick and explains here is how I am, um, here is how I deny the science. So he explains a denial technique and then the game gives cartoon examples of bad logic uh, using that parallel argument. So uh, the edge of the game explaining inducing players to these denial techniques. But then the next part of the game is about practicing the um, spotting these, these denial techniques. Uh, and so it gives examples of myth, myths, um, whether it's uh, climate myths or just just general false arguments with logical fallacies, and you have to spot the fallacy. The idea of over and over, spotting fallacies in misinformation. And as you um, practice more and more, um, the difficult process of identifying reasoning fallacies in a misleading argument becomes more effortless. In Daniel Kahneman's book, fast and slow thinking. He talks about those two types of thinking, fast thinking and slow thinking, but he also talks about a third way of thinking, which he calls expert heuristics. And um, he uses the example of a heart surgeon who is operating on somebody and he can look at a really complicated situation um, while he's operating and make a snap instant decision. Um, and the reason why he can do that is just through years of experience and practice. As you practice a task over and over again, what began as a difficult, slow thinking, um, effortful task, gradually through practice becomes a fast, effortless task. And uh, it was while I was developing this game while work, reading Daniel Kahneman's book, rereading it, I realized the potential to turn slow thinking into fast thinking, to, to get people practicing critical thinking until it becomes a mental shortcut or a heuristic. Um, and so maybe I've been living in the US too long, and you know, I've kind of internalized the NRA's argument, but uh, gamification offers the potential to replace bad heuristics or bad mental shortcuts, such as our vulnerability to being misled by logical fallacies, and replace it with a good heuristic, which is our ability to spot um, fallacies quickly and effortlessly after enough gaming practice. So that's the first um, challenge, the psychological challenge. Um, the second was structural. How do, how do we reach those echo chambers? As I was developing the game, I started talking to climate scientists uh, about the game. And what really struck me there was their enthusiasm for using the game in classrooms. And at this point, we're very early in game development, but uh, without even trying, uh, I already had teachers throughout the US um, ready to use the game in, in their classrooms without um, before it was even ready. Uh, and this was in all different parts of the country, red states like Texas and Utah um, and West Virginia, as well as um, blue states like um, New York or Massachusetts or California, um, all over the country. Now I realized that the classroom was um, potentially a really powerful way to reach um, all of the population, including those, those conservative parts of the country that would normally be resistant to um, receiving um, receiving you know inoculations about misinformation 
um, that said, I, I, I know that it's um, educating through classrooms doesn't get all the actual cranky uncles or the older parts of the population. Um, but it certainly is, is a powerful long-term strategy. And I, th I think uh, one of the most impactful and long-term ways to push back against science denial. Now the third, the third, whoops, yeah, no, sorry, so let me just jump forward. Um, so actually, I'm hoping this afternoon, if I get time, to actually publish this on, on my crankyuncle.com website, which is a teacher's guide to using the Cranky Uncle game in the classroom. So I've already been talking to a lot of teachers who've been um, experimenting with using the game in class and developed a whole set of ideas classroom activity ideas for teachers and we're going to um, uh, we're going to publish that make it available to any teacher um, and and then collect as much research data as possible over this spring semester um, measuring how effective the game is at different age levels we've already had teachers sign up from grade six all the way up to grad school in the universities so uh, it's a huge range and we really have no idea how effective the game will be at different age levels. It's, we've already done pilot testing showing that it works at undergrad level and senior high school. Whether it works all the way down to middle school uh, is yet to be determined. So that, that should be interesting. Uh, lastly, um, the social challenge. The fact that uh, issues like climate change are deeply polarised and tribal. Uh, how do we get around that? Now this is speculative, but and it's something that we will explore down the track, hopefully in the second half of this year. But one thing that games can do is motivate people by appealing to their tribal instincts. When you get a group of people competing against another group, that's when tribality motivates people to act. So if if the tribe was a classroom. Um, in, for example, Texas, um, playing a critical thinking game against a, another classroom in, say, New York, um, so a red state versus a blue state. But the contest is um, critical thinking. It's a, who can who can um, perform better in the cranky uncle game in identifying misinformation fallacies. Tribality is motivating them to get better at critical thinking. And so the big irony is tribality actually polarizes people on climate change normally. But what happens when you use that same tribality to motivate people to build up their own resilience against misinformation? I don't actually know the answer to that, but it will be fascinating to, um, to test it out and see what happens. Now, the last thing I want to do is just share a few resources with you. If you're, if you're interested in climate change or um, responding to um, climate misinformation. Um, we've, one thing that um, the skeptical science team that I'm involved in um, uh, have put together is a resource that we did with the University of Queensland. We developed a massive open online course about climate misinformation. And we basically took this critical thinking approach and applied it to 50 of the most common myths about climate change identifying the fallacy in each myth, as well as the core fact that, that um, falsifies the myth. And we summarize it all in a very short one-stop uh, resource, and the URL is there, sks.to slash fmf. So if you ever need a one-stop short answer to a climate myth, that's the best place to go. And it also links to a video lecture that we've created for every myth as well as um, a link to the skeptical science rebuttal, which goes into it in much greater detail, as well as links to the primary research. Uh, again, um, if you need, if you're doing um, talks about climate change, lots, or talks about critical thinking, there's lots of, um, lots of ca cartoon parallel arguments you can grab from um, the PowerPoint that I make freely available. And if you have any other questions, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions now, but also you can email me at that address and you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, 
if you want to get updates about Cranky Uncle, you can um, go to, go to crankyuncle.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'll be sending an email either today or tomorrow about the teacher's guide. And also, this all this critical thinking stuff, uh, I posted a whole bunch of videos going into much more detail uh, on YouTube, and you can grab all of those videos at that URL. Uh, I'll finish there, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Professor. That was a wonderful talk. And I, I very much resonate with the, um, the cranky uncle character, as I do indeed have uh, an uncle who denies climate change. Every uh, family meal I've ever been to, uh, he's convinced that, um, or excuse me, <coughs> he's convinced that uh, NASA are misleading the world and uh, the, the deep state. So I, I, I get lost. The ancient bloodlines. It's all, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but yes, I, I'm happy to uh, welcome. I'm welcome. Oh, I'm happy to uh, welcome everyone to ask any questions if they do have any for, uh, for our wonderful speaker. Let's have a look. Have we got some in the chat here? No, we've got some from our panel members. Have we? Ah, we have. So just just to make let make everyone aware, because this event is being recorded. Um, if you don't want you you to be recorded make sure your camera is off uh just, just a little bit of housekeeping so um first a good child asks how do you avoid inoculation becoming a conspiracy theory in itself for example did you give an example avoid the cranky uncle app it's brainwashing our children so the idea that it might maybe that's indoctrination of itself yeah i mean that's a good question and i've i've gotten that in fact uh, often when I talk about inoculation, climate deniers will respond, ah, oh, you're trying to brainwash, it's all propaganda. And my answer to that is that inoculation is the opposite of propaganda. It's about building people's critical thinking and resilience to be able to assess arguments. So it's making people um, less vulnerable to being misled or being swayed by propaganda and more teaching them to critically assess arguments. And if anyone has a problem with teaching people to critically assess arguments, then they need to take a long, hard look at themselves. Um, uh, also, um, more generally, like how do you tell the difference between a baseless conspiracy theory and real conspiracies? Because real conspiracies do exist. Um, Volkswagen conspired to mislead you know, the public about or um, watchdogs about how much pollution their cars emit. The tobacco industry conspired to mislead the public about the health impacts of smoking. Um, globally, there is a worldwide conspiracy amongst parents to deceive their children that Santa is real. If any of you young people believe Santa is real, sorry, I just I just blew your mind, but uh, <laughs> assuming you guys have figured it out by now. Um, so how do you tell the difference between a, um, a real conspiracy and a, and a baseless conspiracy theory? We actually address that in the conspiracy theory handbook. Um, I think if you just Google conspiracy theory handbook, it'll come up. You can also go to sks.to slash conspiracy, uh, and that's a freely available book. And the first page addresses this question. There are specific traits of real conspiracies or, or conventional thinking, which distinguishes it from traits of conspiratorial thinking. For example, a conspiracy theorist has overriding suspicion of institutional sources, but healthy conventional thinking has healthy skepticism. Um, not, it, it doesn't gullibly believe everything, but it, uh, it, um, it just considers everything and then, and then makes a balanced conclusion. But the difference between overriding suspicion and healthy skepticism is one of those ways of telling the difference. If someone believes that NASA is um, deceiving the public with all of their data and they're faking the moon landing and they're faking the climate data, and um, that's a red flag of conspiratorial thinking. And so therefore being aware of the traits of conspiratorial thinking is one of those keys to inoculating ourselves uh, and others against um, misleading conspiracy theories. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, 
So yeah, feel free for anyone to put any more any questions in the chat. Um, I think the, the next question. Shreyas, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, sure. I had a few, but um, perhaps the most interesting was how effective have memes been in um, sort of inoculating people? And has this been tested or how effective do you think it, they could be? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, they can be effective if they're well designed. Um, one of the attractions of this cartoon parallel argumentation is it's very memeable. You can you can boil down a, an inoculation into a little a pithy little cartoon that's very um, tweetable, very easy to post on social media. And so we've been testing that approach and comparing it to other approaches like a more critical thinking approach, like using like a, a serious infographic that deconstructs an argument versus a cartoon meme. And what we found is both approaches are roughly equally effective, but for different reasons. The serious infographic is effective because it has higher credibility. And that we found using mediation analysis that the higher credibility was the pathway that caused it to debunk the myth or, or reduce the credibility of the myth. But we found using eye tracking that um, people looked at um, cartoon memes longer. It just held their attention more. And that greater attention was the mediator that, um, that caused the, that particular approach to debunk the myth or, or reduce its credibility. Uh, but on top of that, we also found that the memes were more likely to be liked and shared. They were more viral. Uh, and so given that they're both effective, but one is also more viral, uh, it, it points to memes as being a really powerful way of countering misinformation. And because you can, the, the beauty, the, the elegance of parallel argumentation is you don't have to explain all the complicated science in order to neutralize a myth. You just have to explain how it's wrong. Uh, and you don't have to explain how it's wrong um, by having to go into detailed explanations. The beauty of analogies, which is what parallel argumentation is basically a logical analogy, analogies borrow existing concepts in people's heads. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're just piggybacking on things that they are already familiar with and then using that to um, elegantly explain or debunk a myth. So I think the answer is, yeah, memes are very powerful. Thank you. Wonderful. We have a question in the chat from uh, Medi, Med, uh, sorry, Medi Rodriguez. Uh, shall I ask the question, Maggie? Or feel free to unmute if you, uh, if you want to ask it yourself. Oh, uh, you can ask it, no problem. I'll ask it. It's fine. Maggie asks, what's the role of emotion? inoculating people and how can we harness it to this end emotion both radicalizes and galvanizes people maybe yeah, it can be used in the uh, reverse direction as well with the knowledge of these cognitive effects so there's a lot of there's 50 years of research into inoculation and um one thing that i didn't mention in my um presentation but i'll just mention now is that there are two elements to an inoculating message. The first element is the warning of the threat that you might be misled. And then the second element is the counter arguments that explain how the misinformation misleads. Um, inoculation research has found that both elements are important, but most of the heavy lifting, the most important part of the inoculation is the warning. Uh, it's it's just putting people on guard. It's 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 almost like an emotional appeal. It's saying it's like danger will Robinson um, myth approaching, and by putting people on guard, it, it activates their aversion to being misled, which is uh, like I, it's if we if you want to kind of use that slow thinking versus fast thinking, fast thinking being the emotional instant response and slow thinking being the, the rational. You know, reasoning out a problem, um, the warning is the fast thinking part, and the the counter arguments is the slow thinking part. 
And so that's what, one of the reasons why inoculations are powerful is they work on both levels, fast and slow. Uh, and so um, you, there is an element of emotion to them in the sense that you're appealing to people's aversion to being misled. And that aversion is bipartisan. I found with my inoculation research during my PhD that inoculating people against the technique of fake experts um, worked across the political spectrum. It inoculated climate misinformation for both conservatives and liberals um, because everyone wants to avoid being misled. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Let's see what other questions we've got. Travis has got another question. You know, uh, we've got Chris's question as well. I'll ask Chris's question. Shall I, Chris? Um, do you think that we discussed earlier part of the talk uh, the idea of these the different groups when it comes to climate denial? The you know the, the unconvinced and the um, I think the act was it actively the actively distrustful is that sort of seven percent I think you said that you know actively sort of rail against climate change as a concept. Do you think that and and you discussed how it, it's probably more effective to to focus on the, the sort of middle more middle of the road doubtful people do you think that that sort of extreme percent are they lost to reasonable argumentation is there a way to reach them or do you think perhaps a certain proportion of them are lost to to, to being reached by um by you know reasonable argumentation by are they just is that is that just you know endemic in that population um some of them for all practical purposes. Some of them you might peel off, like the 7% of dismissives, but it would take enormous resources to do it. Basically, like my dad used to be dismissive and years and years of conversations, you know, eventually he turned around. My father-in-law was also dismissive. He didn't and he never will. Um, I, could talk, I could be locked in a room with him for a year and we'll probably kill each other in the first week. But <laughs> so so um, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm derailing my line of thought, but uh, I think that the, the important consideration here is if we have limited resources to make a difference in the world, what should we spend those resources on? Should we be, spend all our time banging our heads against a brick wall to try and change a few minds? Or should we um, spend our efforts on the 93% of the population who are open to evidence? Um, and then the next question is, do we need 100% convinced in order to achieve whatever it is that we are, whether it's climate action or um, herd immunity amongst the, the population against COVID or whatever? Um, usually not. Uh, and so, if it's only 7% who deny the science, I, I'm not saying we should abandon them and I'm not saying that they're completely lost, but in terms of what's practical from a communication point of view, I think that um, focusing on the 93% is, is more productive than trying to change the minds of that 7% who most of them aren't going to change their minds no matter what we say. Wonderful. Um, we've got a question. Here yeah, from Chris Kirsty, good job. Would you? And she said you, you wouldn't mind uh, asking yourself. Go ahead, Chris. Feel free to unmute and uh, ask uh, speaker. Uh, hello. Can people see me? Yeah. Yes. Um. So I like this idea of the fake expert thing. Um. But sometimes it seems like the fake expert, the classic one, seems to be like this guy who works in the supermarket and posts loads of memes about vaccines not being real, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's quite easy to show to people that he is not a credible source. But what happens when the fake expert is someone who does appear credible? So like there's the example of Dr. Simone Gold, who's got a video about um, the COVID vaccine and the truth about it. Um, my cousin has read a book about the I think they're called the Anunnaki and it's like this alien species and 
Um, she believes it all. I googled the author and he has a medical degree. So when the expert who is quoting this misinformation does seem to have credibility, how do you debunk it to people then and show them that they're wrong? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, in in that when I showed that taxonomy of the, the flick and all the sub fallacies, underneath fake expert, there was one technique called magnified minority. And this involves taking people who may be an have some degree of expertise, uh, but they are an outlier in their community. And, um, you know, there are a handful of actual climate scientists who are still climate deniers uh, and they still pump out misinformation trying to mislead the public. And they are, they're not fake experts. They're, they are climate scientists, but they are, they're outliers. And so the way to respond in that situation is to put that lone voice in the context of, of the expert community. In climate change, we talk about how there's 97% uh, agreement amongst climate scientists. So there is 3% who disagree, um, but they are a vanishingly small proportion and there's no meaningful debate um, within the expert community. Uh, and the same, so one way is to talk about consensus, like what is the actual level of agreement amongst experts. Another is to talk about institutional consensus. If you have the, um, the like National Academy of Science or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with Climate, or you have the NHS and, and the World Health Organization, and you have the institution institutional consensus, um, then you position this. Well, this person says this, but you know the the consensus amongst the scientific community is this. So that. One person is is an outlier compared to um, compared to the, the broad science community, expert community. There's a saying that's it's a bit dark, but um, there's a truth to it. Science progresses one funeral at a time. You you do have um, these contrarians in any field. You you have plate tectonic deniers, even though that's a really old you know consensus. Um, and some of those people will go to the grave denying the science. Um, it's, it's just kind of a, a grim reality of, of humanity that you do get these outlier individuals. Um, so I have used an argument similar to that uh, to deny this, but then you get people who say, well, you know, you do sometimes have outliers in science who are right. Um, so, like, when uh, the theory about everything revolving around the sun rather than the earth came out, like, that was right. So when people counteract that outlier argument by saying, well, what if they are right? What if we're ignoring them, like we ignored this scientist in the past who turned out to be right? How do you then challenge that counter argument? Yeah, that's a good question. So I gave a URL earlier, sks.to slash fmf. Actually, no, no, let me keep point. Uh, write this one down if you want to go check this out. Um, we All the video lectures from our massive open online course are listed at sks.to slash denial101x videos because um, the MOOC is called denial101x. Uh, and in those videos is a video called Knowledge Based Consensus. Um, so if you, maybe if you Google knowledge-based consensus video, you might find it. This a short lecture by a climate scientist, Peter Jacobs, and he explains um, how do you tell if a consensus is what philosophers call knowledge-based or true? Now, how do we know a consensus is going to stick? Because sometimes you do get consensuses like the, um, the sun revolving around the Earth. Um, or you know whatever the opposite of plate tectonic was, I guess it was that that plates don't move on the Earth's surface, um, and they turn out to be overturned. And what he explores is that you can be confident that a scientific consensus is knowledge based or true and lasting if it fits these three criteria: one, it's based on a consilience of evidence; multiple lines of empirical evidence all point to the same conclusion; two, the consensus amongst the scientific community has diversity 
So it's not all just a bunch of white dudes in North America in one discipline. It's it's a diversity of scientists across different countries and across different disciplines. The greater the diversity, the stronger, the more resilient the consensus is. And thirdly, th there's social calibration, meaning that all these scientists are speaking the same language, usually like empirical evidence-based um, science. Uh, I strongly recommend checking out that knowledge-based consensus video. It gives a, a good, well-rounded explanation of, of when you can trust the consensus. I, I've, I, I've actually run out of time. I have to go to another okay. meeting. I think we might have to finish up. Yeah, sorry. I, I was just about to say, I, I was just about to ask if you uh, need to go. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you so much for coming to give a talk today. Um, we're very grateful. And I'd also like to um, say to all of the people watching today, thank you to so many of you for coming along. And also, uh, I'd like to welcome, so we've had quite a few people today who have come from outside of Cambridge to join our show. And I'd like to say that you're warmly welcome to these events and um, feel free to come to join our, our Facebook group and come to future events with the, with the sign up sheets. We've got an event next week, which we posted at the top of the chat. And um, thank you so much to everybody. And we will we'll make a, a, a link to this recording available very soon. Thank you very much, Professor John Cook. Thank you very much. Um, and it was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.